Hello everyone and welcome to How to Land on the Moon Energia style. Energia was the launch system most famously used to launch Buran and also Polyus, but it could be used for other things. And what we have here is the top of the N1 rocket that you saw in the previous How to Land on the Moon video, strapped to the side of the Energia rocket, <laughs> and basically where Buran would actually sit. And this is not the most efficient way to use Energia, as we'll say, see later on, but it is a way, and certainly the Energia stack is capable of launching the N1's payload. So there's everything, including the translunar stage. And I'm not showing how to put this together because, frankly, I'm not 100% sure. I especially don't think I've got all the fiddly bits on the boosters right because they're not separating. Eventually, I just dump some extra separatrons. Essentially, what you have on the energy stack is the top cone, which is the protective shield on top of the liquid oxygen tank. And then there's a liquid oxygen tank, and then there's the hydrogen tank. And then at the bottom of the core, that's the core, you have the four RD0120 engines, which are the equivalent of the space shuttle main engines. And it has four of them. And then there are four boosters. They're the Zenit boosters. They have a nose cone that comes with this pack. This is the DEC-Q Energia mod. And at the bottom of the Zenit tanks, there are RD170s. Altogether, this provides more thrust on liftoff than the Saturn V did and all of its engines are more efficient, so its lift capacity is actually more than the Saturn V's, except it's got the one and a half staging deal here, which complicates matters. And you can see the booster separation there, so obviously I haven't gotten that right. Uh, the boosters do separate in pairs. They separate uh, together in pairs first, and then separate from each other. And uh, that's a whole complicated business that I haven't figured out. So. Sorry for not explaining how to put it together, but I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Um, but here we go. Now the problem is, with it on one side, you actually have to either shut down a pair of engines or tilt the engine a certain way, otherwise it's going to flip out like this. And I demonstrate, but that's alright. This is not the mission we're going to take to the moon. I'm going to try and use energy properly without strapping something to the side, but instead strapping something to the top and there it's much more efficient. But you can see all the Delta V we left in this stage just lifting the N1. So here we have it on the top. There is an alternate tank that you can use called the Vulcan Oxidizer Tank that sits on top of the hydrogen tank. That's that one right there. And then I used procedural fairings to include a Vesuvius stage from the same mod, the DEQ Energy mod. The Vesuvius stage is a Hydrolox stage instead of the Carolox stage that we we're using with the N1 stack. So this is much more efficient. The Vesuvius stage is roughly equivalent to the SLS's Exploration Upper Stage, or EUS. It has about the same thrust, but only one engine. So instead of having four engines, it has all that thrust in one engine, the RD-57M. And also, it has about the same burn time. It's about 15 minutes. It's about as efficient, too, 461 seconds of ISP. So really, it's basically the exploration upper stage. <laughs> Maybe a little bit uh, lighter and with a little bit less burn time. So, yeah, and it's used for basically the same idea. Now, on the top, we don't have just the L1 stack anymore. Not the L1 stack, sorry. The, the lunar stack. We don't have the lunar stack from the N1 anymore. Here I add Separatrons to the boosters. Sorry about the lag, but it does have this kind of lag. And since I had music set to it, I couldn't uh, speed it up or anything. Uh, yeah, it was painful. So anyway, now it's just the RD-0120s, uh, and they carry it to orbit. If you've ever launched a shuttle, it's basically the same trajectory kind of thing. Uh, you have to be careful because this, this version is very tall, so I was worried about it flipping. Anyway, uh, we finish orbit with the Vesuvius. Now, unfortunately, I haven't figured out how to configure this engine to have a plume. I tried to put a plume on, but it didn't like it. It does not like to have a plume. So, I'm working on that. I'll put the configuration for Deku's Energia in the video description, as I have it, but it's not going to have the plume fixed yet. Okay, so here's the innovation. Uh, we have a station with us. That is an Almaz station with two docking ports. It's an uh, Almaz that wasn't actually built. Ritternik added it to his um, Soviet, uh, sorry, the Salyut stations pack. And so I decided to try it out for this purpose. So we're launching the entire N1 complex, uh, you know, uh, the Block D and uh, the Lander and the Soyuz, plus 
we're transferring over a station. And also, the station has its own little Briz stage to get it into orbit. So, the N1 stack will get into orbit itself, and then the station will get into orbit itself as well. So, the Vesuvius stage is actually burning here, even though it doesn't have a plume. And I have to do the burn in two steps, because it's 15 minutes long. And if I tried to do it all at one go, it'd be very inefficient. So, I do uh, one go, get it to about a three hour orbit and then do a second burn to get to the moon. Similar to what the Indian lander is doing right now, slowly lifting its orbit up over multiple passes. But uh, here we are, and we're getting an orbit, well, we're getting an approach with the RCS. Typically, if you've got a nice powerful engine, you want to shut down with uh, some Delta V to spare and just do the rest of RCS. And that is what we are doing. Now, the Soyuz in this mission is running on fuel cells, not solar panels. And apparently, those fuel cells cannot be shut down. That's realistic, and you can't shut them down. So, uh, after about two weeks, it's going to run out of power. So, there's not a whole lot of point docking this Soyuz to that station, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we can launch a different Soyuz with solar panels uh, to the station. And we could use an Energia M to do that. Energia M is just... Uh, a different core tank. It has one RD0120. I suggest just using a procedural tank for it. Um, get it to about an 8 minute burn time with just one RD0120. And then using two of the Zenit boosters instead of four. So it's sort of a mini energy in that case. Okay, so we have separate. We are in Lunar SOI and we've separated off the N1 mission from the station and its Briz. And we are going to get the station into orbit first, but first we actually had to correct the orbits because the periapsis was a bit high. I'm cheating a bit using the verniers here, but I'm going to account for that and leave one ignition with the main engine. I just wanted to use the verniers so that it'd be more accurate. If you light the main engine, uh, it needs to happen in like a second, so that's not very good. I wanted to make sure, I mean, a computer could do it. It's a little bit hard for me to shut down accurately. So, here we go, making orbit with the Salyut, uh, sorry, Almaz, Almaz station. Uh, but we don't want to bring it all the way down because the Briz takes a really long time to burn, and we'll miss the burn point for the N1 mission if we do that. So, I just got into a loose orbit and then quickly switched to this mission, and it does its burn to get into a proper low orbit. We'll deal with the station later on, and we'll dock this Soyuz to it, even though the Soyuz, this Soyuz wouldn't be able to stay. I need to make sure that the Soyuz retains enough fuel to dock with the station and still get back home. So that's part of the test. Otherwise, the rest of this operates basically like the N1 video mission did. I'll just very quickly go through that, but yeah. Uh, once again, you separate off the Soyuz, you start off with the lander here, using the block D again to do most of the scent burn. And this time I had a higher pass, unfortunately, so didn't really do uh, as good a job as last time. Used a little bit more fuel, and also on the suicide burn, right at the end, the final landing burn, I uh, needed some help. Now remember, this lander has backup engines that you can use. They only have two ignitions. But this was a good time to use the backup engines because the suicide burn was not counted properly and I would have smashed into the ground with just the regular engines. So I used the backup engines for a little bit and then turned them off and landed properly. So this is by way of showing the capabilities of the Energia rocket. It could launch the Apollo mission with the S-4B too. So if you wanted to put an S-4B with Apollo and the LAM on top, you can do that. It can carry that. Uh, to orbit just fine on top. Uh, just make sure to switch out the regular uh, cone-shaped tank at the top with the Vesuvius, not the Vesuvius, the Vulcan oxidizer tank. The Vulcan rocket was a modification on the Energia that had four, uh, sorry, uh, eight boosters instead of four. So that has even more lift capacity. This Energia has a capacity of 140 tons to low Earth orbit. So, yeah, it's uh, basically the equivalent of a Saturn V, though overall lighter because of its greater efficiency. Um, if it was as heavy as a Saturn V, it'd be able to carry more. But, uh, 
and that's basically what Vulcan is. And the text I had there was, energy is better without Baran, and it's true. Uh, it's true. Baran really held it back. If they had saved the money on Baran, which didn't actually do anything for them, and used it for anything else, like a moon mission maybe, uh, I don't know if the moon mission would be the most constructive thing. Maybe a big space station, because the Soviets did space stations a lot. If they had, uh, instead of a uh, mirror with all the little modules, you know, have a larger core module, that might have been something. A lot of the time when people say Baran was better than the space shuttle, what they mean is Energia was better than the space shuttle stack. And Energia, if it was properly used with uh, as a heavy lift vehicle, would have probably uh, put the United States on the defensive because the United States didn't have that capability at the time. Baran itself uh, had a drawback of not bringing back the main engines. And I, I'm not as fond of it, actually as I am of the shuttle. The shuttle actually conducted missions and I, I like it a lot better. I don't mind that the pilot actually has to land the thing. That was never the problem. After all, if you just want to send cargo up on in an automated fashion, you'd rather not use a shuttle like Baran because that limits your cargo capacity to 30 tons for Baran or thereabouts. And instead, you should just use a heavy lift vehicle, for instance, or something cheaper like Proton for a 20-ton payload. You wouldn't, you would only use Baran if you had crew, uh, which, of course, they didn't need Baran for crew because they had Soyuz. Obviously, there were problems with the solid rocket motors and the tank on the shuttle, but those were picked because those were being discarded, basically. Though they tried to use the solid rocket boosters. Um, and they wanted to make them as cheap as possible, unlike with Energia, where they made their stack expensive, A, because they were hoping to make it reasonable, though they didn't have the money to do that, and B, really they wanted a heavy lift vehicle. Really, the people who made Energia didn't want the shuttle portion. The shuttle portion was the way they funded it, uh, by convincing the military that they needed a shuttle equivalent, but really they wanted the heavy lift vehicle instead. So that was the plot there, and that's why they made it so much more efficient, because what they really wanted was Energia. They didn't, they didn't want the, the shuttle copy. When had the Soviet space program ever copied the United States or tried to uh, imitate the capabilities of the United States? Uh, always it was the Soviet space program leading, so it was an odd thing. And of course, what they wanted was to lead in the area of heavy lift capability. Uh, that didn't turn out very well with the collapse of the Soviet Union, but still, that was the real purpose of this, uh, not to lift the shuttle. Anyway, here we have the Soyuz docking with the, the Amaz station, and the Amaz station used its Briz multiple times to really do most of the rendezvous stuff, and the Briz has multiple ignitions, so that's okay. And you can see from the Delta V reading down there that the Soyuz does have enough to return home. 800 is minimal. And uh, here we have buffer to account for inclination issues and make course correction and stuff like that. Now you might have noticed that the lander couldn't dock to the Soyuz, and that's because we have the docking port here for this station, and that's actually blocking the way of the docking port for the lander. And so we weren't able to actually make a dock with the lander, and that's fine because the cosmonaut would have had to EVA out and get into the Soyuz anyway. That was part of the plan. So, making a dock would have helped as far as transferring the food, water, and oxygen, but other than that was not necessary, and we needed a docking port in order to do this. Obviously, in real life, hopefully they would have fixed docking ports by the 1980s when the energy was available. <laughs> so, by that time they had docking ports that people could pass in and out of, and they probably just used this one instead of the one that's on the top of this particular model of Soyuz by default. Anyway, I'm checking the supplies um, because we're going to have them hang out despite the fuel cell situation and we'll eventually bring them back. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time.